Okay, everyone, we are going to get started. So, there's some video. Hello, Tom Knockholds here, and I'm joined by Nikki again. Um, and this week, we're really excited to be introducing you to a, a new section of the small scale community solar guide. This, this is the section on the common legal framework and other various aspects of legal agreements that we cover in the guide. So um, a bit of housekeeping, uh, please use the chat panel to ask questions. Nikki's uh, going to be uh, looking after those and uh, we will probably take questions at the end and we'll try to leave about 15 minutes for that. Uh, any clarifying questions which are perhaps preventing you from understanding um, what's going on, uh, we'll also weed those out and we'll answer those on the fly. We're going to be we're going we're going to be recording um, this webinar for publishing later. So if you need to drop out halfway, or you're aware of someone who wasn't able to join us tonight, then um, be aware of that. Um, and I guess a small legal disclaimer: this this presentation covers a lot of legal aspects. So community power agency and the Coalition for Community Energy are, are not legal services providers. We're not lawyers, and none of what we are providing you tonight should be considered as legal advice. If you're considering adopting some of these legal concepts, you should seek your own legal advice as an organization. So, um, what are we, why are we here today? I'm gonna to give a very brief recap on uh, that we covered some material in last week's um, webinar uh, of why the small scale community solar guide, where it came from and what it, why it was updated. So it was released in 2015 as part of the National Community Energy Strategy and Initiative of the Coalition for Community Energy. Um, in fact, this guide was published as, as, as Appendix E. That entire project was funded by um, ARENA, the lead author was the Institute for Sustainable Futures at UTS, from hereafter referred to as ISF. Um, and there were several key collaborators to that, um, to that document, including um, Embark, Repower, Meth, Moreland Energy Foundation, Clear Sky Solar Investments and Starfish en uh, Enterprises. Why are we looking at updating this guide? Well, in late 2016, there were two new models that came into existence. Pingala and Lismore got their um, initiatives across the line. And those two organisations decided to write their own case studies to insert into the guide. And what actually happened was there was a, a, effectively a draft update created at that time. We want to shout out to Brendan Lim, who also volunteered his time to update the decision tree, the visual diagram uh, in that guide. And the Co Community Energy Congress in February of this year, 2017, um, we started becoming more aware that there was a lack of awareness of the guide. This is perhaps no surprise, it was after all published as Appendix E of the National Community Energy Strategy and that gives you an idea of how many appendices there were. Um, so perhaps people didn't realise that it was sort of lost in the bigger news. We also at the Congress picked up on this strong theme of partnerships and as part of an initiative to make sure that we were capturing the momentum from the Congress, um, we actually sought some sought some funding to update the guide. This is seen as a quick win strategic initiative of the coalition. So where are we now? Well, we've updated the guide and the link on your screen is one way that you can access it. Um, it's a standalone document and we're really grateful to Sustainability Victoria for paying for this update. Community Power Agency acting in our capacity as the Secretariat for the Coalition for Community Energy with a lead author of this guide but again, we had a bunch of collaborators. I'm not gonna read all the names on the screen, but I will pull out that the existing case studies updated their, updated their um, documents, sorry, their contributions, so that they were more relevant in the current context. And we had five, well, th three new case studies to join the Pingala and Lismore um, case study. Um, Environmental Justice Australia um, collaborated heavily on the legal side of things. So a lot of this presentation and unfortunately they were unable to join us today in a really important meeting. So without further ado, I need, I'm going to play this lovely video from Sustainability Victoria, the funders of the guide. So here's Carl. Yeah. 
Welcome to the Small Scale Solar Guide webinar series taking place each Tuesday throughout the course of September. At Sustainability Victoria, we're passionate about making a sustainable and thriving Victoria, mobilising us all to create a better environment now and for our future. We're proud to have supported the Community Power Agency bringing you this webinar series and the latest edition of the Community Solar Guide. Over the four webinars, we'll get to hear some really innovative ideas for behind the meter investment and some great legal frameworks. I hope you enjoy the series. Thank you, Carl, that's great. Um, and again, the Coalition for Community and is really appreciative for the support and being able to update this guide, it's very exciting. Now, we're running a run of a series of webinars. This is the second of four. So there's two more in the upcoming Tuesday nights at the same time. And um, are you talking about the quality? Quality. Okay, I'm being told the quality is not great. Um, we'll see how it goes. Maybe people could um, post comments into the chat room. Not looking good enough. Um, at this stage, we're really looking back particularly around little things like mistakes in the guide um, but we're also looking for people to contribute to the guide and in October we'll be updating the a minor update of, of a, a version 2.1 if you like please send through any suggestions and if you want to contribute to anything secretariat at c4ce.net.au so what are we doing today we're going to be stepping through the common legal framework mostly. Um, so we're going to talk about why, why, why we need it at, um, at addition, what's its relevance, what, what scope does it have. Um, before we do that, we'll actually talk about recapping the legal basics um, that's in the introduction of the guide. And then really moving into common legal, frame, legal framework is consist, consists of, it, it's essentially three parts, a standard set of participants and a standard set of agreements that establish a common language so that when we're talking about the elements that make up the business model of a community energy project, we're all talking with the language. And then the third component is a common visual uh, arrangement, which is which really going to be um, coming to its coming into its own when we when we look at this gallery of all the legal models that we've put together. Um, and finally, we're going to talk about um, how we've improved the signposts so that you, uh, someone looking at doing a community energy project, um, can more readily get your hands on the agreements and templates to agreements that are already out there um, that groups have already developed. So why do we need a common legal framework? Well, this idea has been in the, in the works for some time. Um, I actually think the best way of, best way of talking to this is to show you um, the way, different ways in which the different groups have been describing their structure and the legal agreements that underpin their, uh, underpin their projects. So what this slide shows you is there's just a huge diversity and no consistency around the way that the groups are describing themselves. They do hold some things in common. Um, the, re the repower, which is the green boxes in the top left, has boxes that comprise the enter or sort of the major players or participants. And the arrows tend to describe the legal agreements, maybe other activities as well. And we can sort of see that when we start to think about, hey, how am I going to adopt one of these models or adapt it to suit the needs of the community solar initiative? Um, how, does, how, how is that going to translate? And more, more importantly, which bits are we talking about that are the same between the different models? What, um, what is it going to look like for me when I start putting, it, putting that into practice in developing my own model? So really what we're hoping is that a common, a common framework will allow us to be on the same page when we talk about what's already out there, but also to talk, talk in a consistent way when we were developing our own innovations or evolutions of those models. So this framework was initially developed with investment models in mind, um, but we soon realised that it could also, also be applied to donation-based models. And for us, it's a little bit of an untested idea that perhaps it can also apply to 
some of the other types of community solar that exist out there, the other types that are, that are in the guide is, the other type that's in the guide is the multi-household models. Um, and maybe there's also hybrid models that can be described. In fact, we're gonna have an attempt at describing a hybrid model today um, using the Common Legal Framework uh, tool. So let's do a quick recap of the legal restrictions. This, this, these concepts come from the introduction to the guide. Um, uh, and there's a section which talks about um, legal restrictions when seeking investments. In a nutshell, it describes how seeking investments is, is, is highly regulated. And most of those regulations come from the Corporations Act. If you want to seek investments from more than 20 investors, there's some key things that you need which actually make it very difficult. You, you need a prospectus or, or some other sort of disclosure document or for information statement, for example. If you're offering a financial product and selling that to another organization, there's a good chance you'll need a financial services license. And depending on the size of your organization, you're probably gonna to need to engage in quite expensive annual reporting and auditing. And all of this conspires to make small scale solar quite difficult. The only model in the guide that tackles this as a, as a company under the Corporations Act is the Sydney Renewable Power Company model. And what they've had to do is scale up of their project to make it actually, to make it financially viable. Um, they've done that very successfully, of course. Now, what groups are tending to do is to, uh, I guess, hack around the rule of these remedies or ways of, of, of avoiding these, these problems. The most common one is, and the first approach was to only offer your investment to your project to less than 20 investors. So this small scale offering exemption is a range of measures across the Corporation Act and often referred to as the 2012 or the 2212 rule. If you offer um, investments to less than 20 non-institutional, non-sophisticated investors, and you're raising less than $2 million, there's a whole suite of things that you don't need to comply with, such as having to have a prospectus, such as having to hold a financial services license. You still can't publicize those. So it's, it's, it's really designed to be able to offer investments to family members and friends and people that you know, so that you can get your small business across the line, up, up and running. The second thing that people have been doing is looking at forming a public company. This is the, the next scale up of cup company. And I mentioned Sydney Renewable Power Company. They, they, they went down this path, but they had to have a larger project because the costs of compliance are, are bigger. Um, that means that there are actually less viable host site candidates out there for groups considering this model. And there tends to be a little bit more complexity involved. It, it's, a, it's a more complex thing to tackle. Um, but it can be done and they've proven it can be done. And finally, we can also, we can also just think about sidestepping Corporations Act and, in, and instead revert to state-based rules such as cooperatives and national law. State-based laws under cooperatives tend to be more appropriate for member-owned organisations. Um, uh, and, and that means that those sort of costs and compliance restrictions are lower, but they're less an organisation out there. So we think that there's approximately 1.6 million registered companies in Australia and about 1,700 cooperatives. So it's quite a lot less common out there. Sorry. Um, before you go on, Tom, yeah. um, some people having a little bit of difficulty with image quality, it goes in and out. So maybe we'll get you to turn your video off. Okay, we'll see if that helps. Yeah. One of the things we're doing is we are sitting in a university. So we are sitting at a location that has the best possible connection to the internet, but you can't control everything, unfortunately. So we'll try and push through. I guess the thing to say is we are recording this and the recording should come through fairly, fairly good quality. Yep. Yeah. All right, so let's introduce the common legal framework. Um, let's control there. So first of all, I'm going to talk about the, 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 the common language. And remember, that's made up of two parts. It's a, it's a standard language for describing the participants that make up a business model from a legal perspective, as well as a standard language for describing the agreement. So let's start with the participants. 
what we always tend to see happening with these investment and donation based projects is there's some sort of project entity. It's the project entity that collects funds and ultimately transfers those funds to pay for some sort of clean energy installation solar. So um, the project entity can take a, a number of different forms and we'll explore that later, but think of it as being the very heart of the model. And for that reason, we put it in the middle of the model as well. The money to pay for projects for these solar projects comes from somewhere. And it's really either gonna come from investors or donors. People who, investors are people who are expecting their money back with or without an additional premium interest. And donors are people who are giving their money and they don't expect to receive that money back. Because we're installing solar here, of course we have to have some sort of solar company. To date, there's no such thing as a community solar company. So we partner with solar companies in the solar industry. So really these are the organizations that install solar panels and maintain them over the life of the project. And of course we have a customer, uh, an organization upon whose roof we install solar and are getting the benefit of that solar. For the investment and many innovation based projects, they're also paying for that. And finally, in some examples, we have a, a services provider. So this is an organization that manages the administration of the project entity. It'll become clearer why that's the case when we start looking at the different models, but be aware that that may or may not exist in some models. Not all of these participants exist in every model, but most of them will exist in most models. And then we have a standard set of agreements. We're installing solar on the roof of an organization. So the first thing we need is a legal agreement that sits between us as the community organization and the solar company that sets out the um, agreement by which we're gonna give the money to, to pay for the engineering, procurement and construction. So we're adopting some standard industry language here because it's helpful to adopt standard industry language when you're talking to industry partners. So just start to get familiar with these, with these terms, EPC and O&M. And the operation and maintenance side of things, O&M, is about maintaining, making sure that the equipment is functioning and you have maintenance schedules across the long duration of the installation of that solar. For the investment-based projects, um, there needs to be some sort of uh, constitution rules or trust deed, depending on the type of organization that the um, project entity is, that sets out the, the rules by which this all works. And then for many of these models, we also have an investment um, investor agreement, which really sets out the obligations of the investors and the, and the, um, and the project entity in relation to each other. A supply agreement is the agreement that sits between the customer and the community group. And it, and it really says, I'm gonna install solar on your roof, what are you gonna do for me in return? How are you gonna pay for it over time? Um, if we're not just gifting it to you, then you know, you're going to be buying the electricity that it uses. Perhaps it's a loan, perhaps it's a lease. We'll talk in more detail about those. Um, and then finally, if we do have that administration, administrative services provider organization, then um, there will be some sort of a services agreement that sets out the obligations of, of each party in, in, in providing those services. So I've just got a couple of things to note here. The icons that I've got here, they're actually, we haven't used them heavily in the document because there's already icons for the entity types. So we've only used them in the diagrams where they're actually needed for clarification. And we think we've got that right, but give us any feedback things aren't clear um, and then just ducking back to this supply agreement this supply agreement component we we originally referred to this as offtake it's a bit of an awkward name we are we are aware of that but again what we're partly trying to do is to adopt standard industry terminology so that we can better interact with the industry when we need to deal with them but think of supply as I'm going to supply your business organization whatever with solar and you're going to pay me for that supply 
whether it's for the electricity or, or in some sort of a loan arrangement. So that all seems a bit abstract. So to make things much more concrete, what we're going to do is we're gonna describe a generic community energy project. And we're gonna do that by bringing all the elements together in a standard visual arrangement. And this is really gonna complete the picture of what the common legal framework is. It's, it's all of those entities, it's all of those agreement types presented in a standard visual way. So, at the heart, we have the project entity. And of course, that entity is going to raise funds from somewhere, either investors or donors. So what we tend to see for the investment models is some sort of constitution rules or perhaps a trust deed, I must update this diagram, um, and maybe an investor agreement to, to handle the, the agreement between the investors and the project entity. Now that money is gonna be given to a solar company, presumably to install solar on the roof of a customer. So an engineering procurement and construction agreement, an EPC agreement is gonna contractually handle that relationship. The solar company goes and installs on the roof of the customer and the supply agreement between the project entity and the customer is gonna handle that, that relationship. And because the panels need to be maintained over time, there's probably going to be some sort of operation and maintenance O&M agreement. And depending on the model and how it's set up, there may also be an administrative services provider providing admin services to the project entity, and we have the services agreement. Now be aware that not every um, entity, not every entity or every agreement exists in every model, and as we'll soon see. They don't always exist, sorry, the agreements don't always exist between the same entities. Um, so we'll sort of see these moving parts moving around, but fundamentally the arrangement doesn't change. The entities are pretty much in exactly the same location um, and the agreements come and go, but they will be pointing generally between the same sorts of entities across the different models. So we're just going to explain these supply agreements in more detail. Um, there's really, it's really quite simple. There's, there's only three of these. There's only three types of supply agreements that exist. The first is a power purchase agreement. And the first investment projects and many of the donation projects are using what's known as a PPA. A power purchase agreement simply is an agreement to buy electricity um, output. So it's priced on a per kilowatt hour basis. Um, and, you know, however much electricity the solar panels produce, that's how much electricity the customer buys from the project entity. And that generates a revenue stream that allows, that, that allows the payment back to the project entity for the installation of the solar. The next two are finance arrangements. And the, the, the lease was, was adopted by Pingala. Um, and it's effectively a, what's known as a finance lease, also known as a higher purchase agreement. So what a lease is, is really simple. It essentially says, I have this property and I'm going to give it to you to use as if it was your own property. Um, and in return, I want you to make, give me regular payments. There's usually a duration for that lease. There's often a calculation of, of consideration for the value of the money that I'm, I'm effectively let, giving to you. So there's a cost of finance expressed usually as an interest rate. And oftentimes at the end of the lease term, um, in many of these models, the solar panels are gifted to the host sites. So they actually say, well, they sell them to them for say a dollar and they then become the property of the customer. And then the third instrument, which is perhaps the simplest of all is, is a loan. The loan is nothing more than saying, I will give you this money and you must pay, that, pay them back to me over these series of pre-agreed payments, perhaps based on um, a set interest, maybe on a variable interest rate. So it's really, I think it's really helpful to understand that as far as we're aware, those are the, really the only three options that we have. If you wanna, if you wanna do an investment or donation-based project, how do you get revenue back to reimburse you for the fact that you installed solar on the roof of a customer, either a PPA or a lease or a loan? So we're going to move on now to what I think is a really exciting part of the document. We've created this models legal gallery. And really one of the benefits of having this 
its ability to compare and contrast um, the existing models. And it was always part of the vision of creating this framework to create this gallery. And look, we're really happy with the way it's come, come together. So we're gonna step you through some of the models that exist in the gallery and talk to them in some detail. And hopefully what this will do is it'll bring these, all of these common legal frameworks concepts together so that you can understand really what's going on here. So we've broken this down into three types. There's investment models, there's donation models, and then there's what we're coining multi-models, um, which is not really a model, it's just a way of showing that you can have a multi, multiple model approach. Um, so let's start with the investment, investment models. Um, I'm gonna start with Repal Shoalhaven, partly because they were one of the first, um, and also partly because many people are quite familiar with them. So it, it follows closely the standard, the standard arrangement, but you'll notice straight away that there's a couple of agreements, well, there's one agreement missing and, and the, power, the, the supply agreement, the A in this example, is, is not in the expected location. It's actually between the customer and Repower Shoalhaven, the association. So why is this? Well, the reason is, is essentially um, what Repower have decided to do is to take advantage of the small scale offerings exemption. And they do this by forming a proprietary company, a PTY LTD company for each of the projects that they finance. I'll just make a note there that for some of their fundraisings, in fact, every, every fundraising apart from their first one, they're using the raised funds to install solar in more than one customer. But nonetheless, they create this special purpose vehicle and that special purpose vehicle has no more than 20 investors investing in it. So you can see you've got the investors on the left and we have a constitution and a shareholder agreement plus a loan note, um, which are legal agreements sitting between the investors and the special purpose vehicle. They take that money and they, give that, they, they enter into an EPC agreement with Sunny Afternoons at the top, um, who install the solar on the, on the, on the customer site. And what's interesting here is that in order to sell electricity, you actually need to have a retail license. Um, and so what Repower have done is they've taken advantage of the exemptions for, uh, taken advantage of exemptions for holding a retail license for small scale solar. These exemptions were specifically designed to allow power purchase agreements like this to take place. But it's the association that holds the retail license exemption. And so the power purchase agreement necessarily needs to sit between the association and the customer. Also, Repower Sholo have been always intended to do multiple projects. So they've got multiple special purpose vehicles. And rather than having each one of them look, you know, uh, doing their own administration, it's the association that does the administration for them. And so that's why we have an administration agreement. Repower Shoalhaven is doing all the admin for all the special purpose vehicles that it creates. And it's holding the single retail license exam for all customers that exist in the Hopefully. Model. Clear sky. I have to speak to I'm not going to be able to go into every project as detailed as that, but Clear Sky uh, are, are worth spending a bit of time on because they took a very similar approach. Although this diagram looks a bit more complicated, it's actually very much the same. Because what they do is they also have a special purpose vehicle for every project. Instead of using a company, they've actually used a, used a trust. And so in the middle of this diagram, we have these two entities. Can They're you both. Go back and forward again, sorry. Yep. And forward. Yep. That's better. Did we get stuck on the slide? Um, the, it was blurry again. Yeah, okay, sure. So what the Clear Sky Solar model has is, is these two project entities. It's a bit hard to explain, I don't have time, but essentially one of them is, a, is, a, is an entity, which is the trust. And well, the, one of them is an entity, which is the trustee company, and they're responsible for managing the trust. The trust is maybe not actually a really a legal entity, it's hard to define but it's effectively the investors. And so sitting between the trustee company and the trust and the investors is this trust deed. There's one trust deed which covers the responsibility of the trustee company to manage the affairs of the investors who are, who are the trust. So you see there that we've got the same elements in the same location, but there's different agreements sitting between them. 
Um, so similarly, um, Clear Sky, at the bottom of the diagram, Clear Sky Solar Investments, the, the sort of the community group, they manage the administration for these organisations. And so that's why there's that operations agreement at the bottom. However, unlike um, Repower, they're, they're not the ones who have the retail license exemption. They decided to outsource all of the difficult stuff to a commercial solar company, their partner, Smart Commercial Solar. And they hold the retail license exemption, which is why the power purchase agreement sits between them and the customer. There's an interesting agreement here in the investor agreement sits between the trust and smart commercial solar. Really what that agreement is saying is we've given you this money and you've used it to install solar on the roof of the customer. You need to pay us back across an agreed schedule based on the amount of electricity that solar panel produces. So that links the power purchase agreement income that smart commercial solar receives from the customer to the income or return on investment that this, the investors need to be receiving back through the trust. So there's a great way of demonstrating we can compare and contrast two to the two pioneering models in this space. Um, Pingala is slightly different. It, Pingala decided to um, use a lease rather than a power purchase agreement. So for the first time we see something other than a PPA here. Pingala also decided to form a cooperative the reason for that is because, partly because Pingala saw the value in um, having some economies of scale happening. So rather than having to pay for the cost of administering multiple special purpose vehicles over time, which creates a somewhat linear relationship between the number of projects and the cost of administration, Pingala wanted to be more, well, they thought they could have a more efficient model than that. It's not right or wrong, it's just the approach taken by Pingala. So you could coin this as a, as a multi-purpose vehicle, perhaps, if you wanted. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the association at the bottom still provides administrative services, even though there's only one, special, only one project entity. Um, the reasons for that are too complicated to go into. Across the left, left, left here, we don't have a constitution. We've got rules, because cooperatives have rules, not constitutions. Um, but likewise, there's an, an arrangement with the, the solar company. I should point out this just describes the first project. It's not a generic description of, of Young Henry's, I'm sorry, of Pingala's model. And then, then we have Lismore Community Solar Farm. So again, we're back to special purpose vehicles, but what this model was designed for was to be more standalone. It was more set up so that this could be adopted by a, a, a community and become a sort of single project that just went and ran and had a life of its own. And that's really the reason why we don't have the bottom bit. We, you know, there's almost no aspirations for the organisation, the Ganella Bar that installed solar panels on the sewage treatment plant, or is it the aquatic facility? I can't remember. But there's almost no aspiration for them to do no more projects. So there's no reason for them to create a separate entity that administers the affairs of the special purpose vehicle. But... It is a company, and so like the Repower model, they have a constitution and a shareholder agreement. And the, the main innovation here is this is the first time we see a loan agreement. So there's much simpler instruments and, and probably probably one worth, really seriously worth considering. Um, and likewise, they're entering into, uh, into an agreement with the solar company who does the engineering and the operation and maintenance. This is a partnership with the council. So we've, we've named the council over here, the customer over here as, as the council. And then the final model in this investment gallery is, is the Sydney Renewable Power Company. Um, I, I think it's probably not gonna have enough time to, I'm not gonna have enough time to explain this one, um, except to say that this was a development as well, the installation of solar was part of a much bigger development that was to build, to demolish and rebuild the convention centre and the, and the exhibition space in Sydney, Sydney's Darling Harbour. And so it was Lend-Lease, sorry, it was Lend-Lease who were the organisation that were doing all of that work. And effectively they just installed all of the solar in partnership with Canadian Solar um, and later on sold the solar to Sydney Renewable Power Company to own for the rest of its working life. But we can see that we can 
take these more complex models and adapt the common legal framework to, the, to those more complex models. I'm gonna move on because I'm conscious of time. So that's the investment models. I'm not actually gonna go into a huge amount of detail on the donation models because I think we've made the point. This, this is a great way of describing the models in a consistent way. So I'm just gonna show you that we can do this with the donation models. The main thing to point out here is that we don't have investor agreements or constitutions sitting over here on the left. I've done a dotted arrow because it just makes sense to me that we need to visually represent that something's happening there between the donors and the project entity. But hey, look what happens with Carino. They don't just gift solar, they actually enter into a low interest loan with the not-for-profit community organization. So we can see that arrangement is very similar to the arrangements that exist in the investment projects. And here's Masset and Rangers. Um, they're actually doing the same thing as Carino. They're, they're taking donations, but not just gifting solar, they're entering into a different type of offtake, a power purchase agreement. And we can also describe how they are doing something really interesting down here, which is they've actually got an embedded microgrid. And the, the power purchase agreement is specifically designed to give not just uh, not just remuneration for the energy, but Macedon Rangers give energy data based on all of the, the sub meters that exist with all the tenants so that the landlord can on bill their commercial tenants. And then the final thing I want to do here is highlight the flexibility of this model. So the slightly wonderful Bendigo Sustainability Group um, are really getting in there and taking inspiration from all of the different parts of the different models that exist across donation and investment projects um, across Australia. And they're not the only organisation out there doing this, and I certainly hope there's going to be many more that are going to start to think beyond, beyond the realms of just doing a simple model, but actually go, well, we can do this simple model to begin with, and then we can build the complexity and build the diversity of what it is that we're doing. So here's how Bendigo Sustainability Group's first project worked. It's a donation project. They took donations um, and they entered into an EPC and O&M agreement with the solar company. And it's very much like Carina and, um, and Masset and Rangers where they don't just gift, but they actually ask for the money back. So it goes back into that revolving fund, very like the Lismore model where it's a close partnership with council. So it starts to look like it's you know, been pulled together. All these different elements have been building up to their business model. But when they did their second project, they continued to take donations, but they also took a grant from a, a bank, a community spirited bank. Plus, they wanted to test the concept that they could actually get a loan from a, from a lending institute. And so they've now got sort of three streams that have led to the funding of their, their sort of second, third project and so forth. Bendigo Sustainability Group have aspirations to do investment-based projects. And when they do, they'll probably create a special purpose vehicle just like Repower and ClearSky did. They'll need to be a constitution to support that. And likewise, they'll probably recycle the existing PPA arrangement that they have. Um, actually, probably what they'll do is there'll be a PPA between the Sustainability Group and the Council because they've already got the retail license exemption between those two entities. So we can see the adaptability of this model and think about how you're going to use this to describe your business model as you build it and, and as you go. Cool. So that's the common legal framework explained. We hope it makes sense. We think it has potential beyond what we've shown today. One of the things that I'm really interested in is to whether or not you could overlay financial flows on the top of it. And certainly you could take all of those models out of the gallery and overlay, you know, print it out on a piece of paper and with a marker, you could overlay how the financial flows work. That would be quite easy. So we think it could easily be adapted to, to cover financial elements as well. And maybe you could take one business model and use a series of diagrams to explain what happens over time. So what happens in the inception phase? What happens in the project development phase? What happens in the, you know, the, the pro project operation phase? And we really want this to be something that's taken on by the community solar sector and community energy sector. And we're looking forward to seeing the creative ways that people start to use this, uh, this, this, this diagram. Right, how are we going for time? 
we're a few minutes over, but you've got time to run through this. Cool. One of the things, so moving on from common legal frameworks, this is a bit of a bit of a part of the legal section of the document. But one of the things that we were hearing increasingly as feedback about the original version of the guide was that people were finding it hard to get their hands on the legal agreements, legal templates that, are, that exist out there. Well, unfortunately, it's beyond the scope of this project and perhaps not when an organisation do this, thing to store, manage or serve up these agreements. However, what we have done is we've tried to create concise summary which describes how you can go about getting the agreements and which agreements are available. So this table in the document uses simple traffic light colour coding and you can see all of the agreement types in a, in a, sort of, in a table. Um, the green agreements, unsurprisingly, are available. Probably you have to request them. Um, the orange, amber, uh, is they're perhaps, they're perhaps available. Maybe you have to pay for them or maybe your request will be considered. But don't, there's no guarantee that they'll be given to you. Um, you have to kind of ask for them. And then the red ones tend to be proprietary documents. They, they tend to be not available. So you, in the last column in the table, we also describe who you should contact. We haven't necessarily listed contact details here, but we've told you who you should contact. You can flick back to earlier pages in the document to see contact details um, for each one of the organisations. So we hope that adds value and makes it a bit easier for people to find uh, the documents. So that brings us to Q&A. We've got 15 minutes. That's good. Yeah, that's great. Um, so if people want to ask questions either using the Q&A function or the comments function, uh, I'll field them. We've got one to start off with uh, from John Thompson. Um, he asks, what's the constraints uh, slash advantages um, of a trust versus a company versus an incorporated association? Certainly more than more than could give an answer and perhaps beyond my capabilities to give an answer right now. But the things I would use to quit is to say horses for courses. I think the best that, that, that I've seen from some people that look at little more social enterprise say that which is to say you should look at what it is that you're trying to achieve as an organisation and choose the um, entity type that best matches what it is that you're trying to achieve. I would say one thing about that, which is if you're doing an investment project, uh, incorporated associations can't take investment and give a return on investment because incorporated associations are not-for-profit. Um, whereas if you're taking investment, you are by nature a for-profit company. Um, I would say, yeah, there's there's pros and cons of every different legal form. Um, what we tend to find is that uh, you the regulations around the Corporation Acts Act, which governs trusts, public companies, uh, and PTY LTD, so private companies, um, are more stringent than cooperatives. But conversely. Every accountant and lawyer in the country knows about them, whereas finding good accountants and lawyers to understand cooperative law is pretty challenging. So, you know, there's these swings and roundabouts that we find. Um, I just want to provide a perspective on that because it, it, is, it is something which is talked about a lot, the, this idea that it's very hard to find legal and financial advisors um, that are specialists in... And... I think while that's true, I think it's also true to say that cooperative law is very s simple and straightforward compared to the Corporations Act. Corporations Act is a beast. It's got so many dimensions and so many elements. If you were to line it up on a bookcase, it would probably be metres and metres long, whereas the cooperative laws are small. Now, there's probably no such thing as a lawyer, for example, who is an expert in every aspect of the Corporations Act. What they tend to be is experts in specific areas and they're all experts in understanding legal principles, which allows them to rapidly skill up in the area of the Corporations Act that your 
asking advice on. And I think it's a small bow to draw to say asking a corporate lawyer to skill themselves up on, co on cooperatives is very similar to, similar to asking a lawyer to skill themselves up on a part of the Corporations Act they're not familiar with. So I actually think it's a bit of a furphy, that one, but that's my personal opinion and I'm a bit of a cooperative um, champion. I haven't had any other questions come through yet. Um, uh, so please do send them through if you have any. Um, are there any other thoughts? Right. I'm looking at John's question again, and it seems to me that he's perhaps asking um, what are the advantages of a trust versus these other forms. Okay. So, uh, probably stretching my knowledge a little bit on this, um, but I, I think I think the reason why a trust was chosen was by by Clear Sky that is was because trusts can can potentially have lower administrative costs than a company. I think the way this is washed out in the real world, and we've only really got Repower and Clear Sky to compare on this, is that they're probably landing at about the same. Um, yeah, a, a trust is also a very specific thing. It's designed to um, protect, the in, protect the investments and the interest of the investments uh, of, uh, and assets of, of, of these beneficiaries. Whereas a company has got a subtly different sort of purpose. It's, it's, a, it's, a new, it's a whole new entity that has its own life and mission and et cetera as an organisation and investors simply own a share of that entity. Yeah. So there's a question from Richard Bentley that's um, a little more uh, political, um, which is the current criticism of energy policy is that little or no investment is happening in new generation. How significant in the national scheme of things is community solar. Will it replace AGL's coals closing coal-fired power plant by 2022? Um, I would say two things about that. The first is we are actually in the process of an investment boom in renewables right now because the renewable energy target comes to an end in 2020. What we don't have is in policy that will enable investment after 2020. And so that's what... Um, right now. Um, in terms of the scale of community energy, certainly there are places around the world where community energy has delivered hundreds if not thousands of megawatts, Germany, Scotland, the US. Um, we think it's probably going to take a while and a lot more policy support than we have right now to scale up the community energy sector um, to that kind of level. Uh, so I think probably not is the answer to the question of whether it's going to be significant enough to replace Liddell. That said, we still think community solar is a really important part of the energy ecosystem and will play a very important role in the medium term if we get the right policy support, right? And there's a um, webinar that I'm running, I think at the end of October or beginning of November around um, community energy policy and campaigning. So can I join that one? I think as well, you know, from a sort of almost big philosophical perspective, community energy groups uh, set their minds to the outcomes that they want to achieve. And they're proving themselves to be really effective at that. And that's no surprise, because guess what? They're made up of people, and people are amazing. So I think if a community energy group set itself up with the specific goal of contributing significantly to the replacement of, say, Liddell, I wouldn't be surprised if they were quite successful at that. The thing is, they might not be that very successful at achieving some of the other benefits and outcomes that other community energy groups hold as being quite um, central to what they do, such as perhaps sh sh sharing ownership and and other social and equity outcomes. But I think people are, people and people in communities can, can achieve amazing things. Um, uh, two good questions. One from Warwick Grundy, who says, hypothetical. Um, if you commence with project model A and it becomes difficult, can you easily change to project model B? Hmm. That's a big hypothetical. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think, in essence, what the Bendigo example shows us is that you kind of can ad ad adapt and uh, adapt over time. Um, many groups, when they start up, they decide not to incorporate. They defer that decision until later. Many groups go for the default incorporation option, which is to become an association. And I really think that's what Repower and Pingala both did. 
and I can talk from personal experience because I'm a volunteer at Pingala. The decision was, do we, the decision that we didn't realise we need, needed to make until quite late in the piece was, do we convert the association into a cooperative, which would have been more akin to what you're describing, or do we leave the not-for-profit association standing? And we're not sure if that was the right decision, but we decided to leave it standing. And we could have e easily made the other decision, which would have been a, a, a switch. I think I'd also say that my understanding is every community energy group that's done more than one project has um, evolved their model as they've gone. Like, uh, I think Repower Shoalhaven has th had three or four different versions of their some of their legal agreements um, as they've worked out what the troubles and difficulties and have learned. So, so community energy groups are constantly evolving and learning. Whether you switch from... Uh, uh, a private company to a trust that's probably less likely to happen, whether you switch from uh, doing special purpose vehicle based projects to having a one organisation like a public company or a cooperative that can do multiple projects, that is certainly something that I know a number of groups are thinking, would think about part of their, the evolution of their, their involvement or, or their, their life. I can totally see in a, a situation arising where one of the models based on special purpose vehicles, it costs about $1,600 a year to manage one of those special purpose vehicles. So if you've got 10 of them, it costs you 16,000 more or less. So maybe if you get to 10 projects, it might be more efficient to fold them all into a public company and it probably won't cost you $16,000 anymore. Maybe it'll be less. Um, so, a really practical question, moving on. Yep. Um, can C4CE provide introductions to lawyers who have some experience in co-ops and are also enthusiastic about community energy and ideally are low cost? It's <laughs> a good question. I think the answer is broadly yes. Um, it's not necessarily a formalised service that the Coalition for Community Energy does. Remember as well that C4CE is, is really a collaborative model is meant to be where the community energy sector comes together to collaborate. So perhaps a good way of answering that is, if you want an introduction, come to C4CE as a member and ask the question of the membership base and an answer will be forthcoming. So for example, if you are you are part of one of the member organisations of C4CE, um, you can join the uh, C4CE members Facebook group and you, there's I don't know, 100 or so people on that. And you can put it out to the Facebook group and go, hey, anyone got good lawyer suggestions? And Tom and I will answer with ours, but you'll get much richer response than if you just came to the two of us as the secretariat. One of the members of C4C should do this call out is the Business Council for Cooperatives and Mutuals, BCCM. Um, and you should probably ask that question of them as well. Great. Right. Okay, uh, so we've got three more questions and then we're going to wrap up. So, have there been any examples of partnering with energy generators as well as community members? Haley, can you perhaps quickly type in a clarification of what you mean when you say energy generators? What are we going to do? Uh, I think what I'm understanding by that is what we talk about around community developer partners or um, so the idea of, of partnering with a large wind developer or an AGL or something like that, mm -hmm. um, maybe I'll have a go, yep, which great. is to go this model of, you know, communities partnering with developers uh, is really big in Europe, uh, lots of benefits. Um, it's been not well developed here in Australia. Um, Infogen started to work with the community around Central West New South Wales and they helped form CENRAC. But that um, project, the Flyers Creek project, has been on hold for a long time, so things have not progressed well. But I, Taryn Lane, one of the founders of, HEP, of um, C4CE and on the board of C4CE is currently working with the Sapphire Wind Farm to look at the way that communities uh, can be involved in that project. Um, I was, I suppose I was answering more around um, renewable energy companies rather than fossil fuel energy companies. Certainly we don't know of any community, and community groups engaging with fossil fuel companies in Australia, though Internationally, if you think about it, um, there's a lot of energy cooperatives 
um, that are utilities in the US and they run big coal-fired power stations. Um, so, next question. Are there examples of community energy groups in Australia setting up a community fund which a proportion of the profits made from renewable energy development is made available to the local organisations? Is this feasible? Yes, there are examples within community energy and the best known example of that would be Hepburn Wind. It's not a solar project, obviously. Are there any examples in solar? So, no, there's Denmark Community Wind, Hepburn Wind and Enova, the community retailer. All of those three projects are bigger than small scale solar. So basically, in the solar space, all of the projects have been under 500 kilowatts and the business model has been pretty lean financially. And so there just hasn't been the money available to gift to, to organi local organisations. Basically, you need to get to an economy, of, uh, to a scale. You know, we're starting to talk about multi-megawatt scale projects when you want to have enough income to be able to have a community benefit fund. Um, that said, That's really interesting. Yeah. That said you know, there are models of community energy, that are like the Carina model and the donation models that are instead of giving money to local organisation are giving solar to local organisations. So it's sort of turning it on, on its head. Yeah, yeah. And it's a really interesting question as well because I think the pure answer to your question is n no, that wouldn't, that's not sort of feasible with a small scale project. But if you've got a small scale model which delivers very many projects, then yes, I think it is viable. Of course, if you've got good projects, probably there's going to be enough left over to have some community benefit fund. Just we're not at a hundred projects yet. I think we'll be there before 15. we before we realise that. Yeah. yeah. Um, so if support for community energy projects runs out in twenty twenty, who's polit who politically is offering support beyond twenty twenty? I'm going to park that question and say let's come back to that. Um, uh, and you can also follow uh, community power agency on our. Um, Facebook page and we, we give regular updates around who's saying what politically around community energy. Yep. So thank you, every, are we done? I think we're done. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, really enjoyed tonight's session. Um, remember to tell everybody that you think might be interested in this about it. The, the landing page for these webinars sponsored by Sustainability Victoria and others is c4ce.net.au forward slash webinars and you can just get that on the C4CE homepage as well. So we'll hope, hopefully see you at some upcoming webinars. We have recorded this and we'll be publishing that shortly. Thank you. Have a great night everyone.